April coming up this month, which means uh, when you're looking for board game news this week, I would highly urge you to be suspect of pretty much everything. Just assume everything you hear is not true until next week. That's an unfortunate thing about the internet during this time. Like, oh, Asmodee has bought, you know, whatever. Well, uh, maybe they have, but they should not announce it this week. Anyhow, uh, lots of great things coming up. This is the month of April, which means not a lot of conventions and things this month. So you should see some more reviews of board games this month. Um, also, I'll be doing a Q&A today. I'll be doing it later tonight, uh, which I don't, I don't normally do them at night, but I'll do one tonight at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hey, let's get to the news. We recorded so much news last week that uh, there's not so much left over for this week. In fact, they didn't announce a lot of news. I think uh, Fancy Flight announced another reprinting of, of Cave Troll. Um, but really, um, I, I want to mention two things. One, last week we posted 48 different videos where we interviewed uh, different folks involved at the Gamma Trade Show. And I urge you to go back and look at those. There is a lot of good information amongst those videos, um, things that are coming out over the course of this year. So look at those for your news for this week. But the second, and I'm very, very pleased to talk about this, is the Dice Tower website is live. If you haven't been to Dice Tower website, I know a lot of people used to go there kind of like, and it just was like a click through site. Oh, there it is, and we're gone. We're hoping now that it's more of a destination website. You go there, and you it, the search engines are vastly improved. You can sort things now by rating. I know a lot of people have asked for that. You can uh, just go in there and look around. You can find a game, and then when you find a game, you can look for a podcast that talks about that game or videos that talk about that game and go back and forth and see maybe what top 10 lists it's shown up on. And hopefully that inner connectiveness of the site, which is also mobile friendly, I'm very happy about that, uh, will we'll make people happy and enjoyable. We have, a, of course, a link for bug reports, and this site will be upgraded and changed as time goes by, but this is obviously a big revamping of a site that was about 10 years old at this point. So, you know, we want to stay up with the times, and this was a stretch goal of our 2014 Kickstarter, which was you know, started in 2014 and is finished now, but I'm very excited with the end product. And I'd love for you guys to check it out and tell me what you think. Hey folks, Tom Vassell here. Jason Levine. And we're back. And today we are looking at a question from Chris about inserts in games. Now, when you open a game, it comes with inserts. Some inserts are great. Yep. Some inserts are bad. You gotta admit that. Yes, some are bad. And some are very specific, especially plastic inserts. And some people have problems with plastic inserts because... Card sleeves. Yeah, card sleeves don't fit into them sometimes, although some inserts are set for that. Or sometimes when like you put the models together, then it doesn't fit in and you have to take the yes. models apart. Or an expansion comes out and then you can't fit it in the regular box. And then some inserts are not very functionally useful, but they have a lot of great artwork on them. Yeah, those ones that are usually cardboard and a half of the box is empty and then it's got a little ditch where you can put the pieces. Well, that's Fantasy Flight. And if you've ever wondered why Fantasy Flight makes those inserts like that, it's because they are very inexpensive for one, but they also hold every they hold the the counters in very firmly usually on top. Yeah. And so the Fantasy Flight doesn't waste money on inserts so that they can spend it extravagantly on other things. Inserts are not cheap. No, no. So what do you do with inserts was his question. Well, me I as a collector, I keep all my inserts. I don't get rid of inserts, <laughs> even the bad ones. But sometimes, like Flashpoint, for example, it had one of those typical cardboard inserts. I have some of the pieces on it, but then the, the repeat pieces, as you get the expansions, I stick them in the under part of, so I lift up the cardboard, I stick it in the under part, fold it down, because those are pieces you'll never use again. And I keep the pieces that I use the most in the middle part, and then I put the boards on the top so it fills out the box nicely. Yeah, I'm not an automatically throw away the insert. I don't like inserts that are kind of useless or worthless. Some companies like Mayfair or, um, well, Mayfair is the biggest one, but there's other companies who use the same insert for every, every game. game yeah. And it's really obvious sometimes you're like, these cards don't even fit there. I almost always get rid of those and just put things in bags. Some things I do because I have the expansion, so I have to get rid of the inserts. 
But if it's a really great insert, I will try to keep it. Like, for example, Pillars of the Earth has a great insert. Yes. Anything Days of Wonder has ever done has a great insert. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite inserts is the insert for um, uh, the Lords of Waterdeep. The way every single piece has a container and everything fits perfectly in that container. But yes, except sometimes inserts are more trouble than they're worth because like in Lord's War Deep insert, you have all those coins sideways and they're a pain to get in there. Yeah. And so the another way around this, and we're not going to get into this very much today, but another way around this is the inserts that Robert Searing makes, insert here.me, and you know, the, all the broken token. Yeah. So do you like those? Would you take I, those? Well, to me, they're... They're hard to put together, so I... Okay, but let's say you. Like, let's say they're well, not hard to put Robert together. Robert actually sent me the the insert for Imperial Assault. Thank you, Robert. And um, so I, he actually, when he sends them, they're already put together, so you don't have to sit there and tap right, but the wood. So you like that better than the insert in the game? Oh, it's by far better. I mean, I hated... I hate not having the inserts, and I actually kept my insert and folded it up and stuck it underneath, so it's there. Are you kidding me? It's part of the game. It's it's part of the artwork. You, I like well, artwork. Jason would have been sad to see when I first moved to America how many <laughs> inserts I got rid of. I, I got, would. I did a geek list on Board Game Geek. You can find it where I, I, I got rid of it because I was putting games inside games, so I had to get rid of inserts, and I got rid of so many. Anyway, tell us what you think in the comments below. What do you think about inserts? Also, email us your questions at dicetower at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Oh, hi, Internet. You know, one of the nice things about being part of a world-famous business is that occasionally people just mail us stuff. Uh, usually it's preceded by an email saying, Hey, guys, I've invented this great game. Do you think you'd like a copy for the cafe? And our answer is always, you bet. Because you never know where the next great game sensation is going to come from. But sometimes... These mysterious packages arrive unheralded by any previous co communication or conversation, and, uh, and those are the ones we really enjoy. Now, last month, we got a care package from a toy company that dabbles in party games. It contains some good stuff that we uh, like to have for the wall, things like Quelf and headbands. You know, not my personal choice of games, but stuff that's very popular with our customers. And so that was great. But what really, really caught our attention was this little game here. Mustache Smash. Mustache Smash. This just came in the mail. Yep. Sure did. So this is a game for little boys and girls who want to emulate dad's glorious facial hair, or perhaps for those proto-hipsters who haven't quite decided what style of mustache and beard they want to grow. Uh, but uh, either way, could be lots of fun. It's a game about smashing your mustache onto the table, trying to collect cards that match your stash. Is it fun? Is it the right game for you? I don't know. That's an entirely subjective question, but I do know we are tickled pink that this just showed up in the mail. Hey, we're taking a look at some more of the organized play cards for the DC Dice Masters game. Here we have Pandora's Box, which, uh, which has a cool global ability to make someone a villain for a brief period of time, which is pretty neat, you know, so a lot of different cards that affect villains works. And also when you're blocking or blocked by villains, your dice get plus one attack, plus one defense. Then we have Constantine here, a very cheap character, only two. <laughs> who once per turn, whenever you feel them, you get one life. So you'll see that you'll be able to use this character, I think, quite often. I think this one will be used in more decks almost than any others. Or Shazam, who's fairly expensive here at seven, but the usefulness is when you purchase him, you add him to your prep area. You're gonna buy him, be able to use him right away, which is thematic and also very useful. Then we have a very cheap Superman card here. Superman 
is only five here. The difference here is when he's KO'd, instead of going to your KO and coming back into play, he's actually gonna to go to your use pile. And that's the disadvantage of paying five for an eight, eight character. I'm still gonna use the Superman. And then Martian Manhunter, who uh, strength characters don't do any damage to him, which again is thematic, and it's pretty powerful for a guy who only cost four. I'll show you five more next week. See you then. Hey everybody, Steve here, and here's your AFR two minute drill. Although this week it's all baseball news, so we'll call it the AFR seventh inning stretch. First up, over at play.com, they're releasing version 4.0 of their award winning History Maker baseball game. The new version will include new game boards and a game booklet that are on a thicker card stock, and the new rule book will include several new updates, including a couple of optional rules that you can add for more advanced gameplay. In addition, they're also now releasing the 2014 Pro Season set and the 2015 Fictional Baseball America set. And in other news, there's a couple of new trading card games that should be released this year. So get your pack opening skills ready. First up is Platinum Series Baseball, and this game is officially licensed by the Major League Baseball Players Association, so you'll be able to draft all of your favorite current players. And it features a mechanic where half the results will come from the batter's card, and half the results will come from the pitcher's card. The other game is MLB Clutch. You can check out some information at MLBClutch.com. And this is going to be the spiritual successor to the early 2000s MLB Showdown. It features a D24 pitch die, and you'll use that to determine which card the result will come off of. And it also features a strategy card deck that you can customize before you play the game. For more information on these and for all of your sports news, be sure to tune in to the AFR Sports Board Game News every Tuesday evening. And for late breaking news during the week, you can follow our Facebook and Twitter page. Until then, my name's Steve, and I'll see you next time after further review. For Dice Tower Productions this week, we'll be reviewing several games, including Batman Love Letter. Let's see, ooh, Welcome to the Dungeon. I can't wait to talk about that one. In fact, most of the games that I'm talking about this week, I'm giving a very positive review to. There's uh, a notable exception. Um, two of the big games that we'll be reviewing this week are Elysium from Asmo Day and Star Wars Armada from Fantasy Flight. Um, both of those, uh, well, you're going to have to wait and see the reviews of those. I got lots of reviews coming from my other contributors, and of course, there's a whole Dice Tower network. Now, the Dice Tower network site has been completely folded into the Dice Tower website, so again, you can always go there and see what the newest podcasts are from all the different podcasts. This week, we're also posting episode 400 of the Dice Tower. Very excited about that one. We have some special guest hosts, uh, Jeff Engelstein and Stephen Bonacor, uh, Z Garcia, and Sam Healy joined us along with several notable guests coming on. So it was a fun to record that one that will be posted uh, tomorrow. So anyhow, what's next? Aha, this. Board game components. Whether they're meeples, movers, money, minis, cards, cardboard, counters, or coins, they're the fiddly bits that come with games that make them all the more fun and immersive. But there's one component whose purpose and proper use remains a mystery to nearly all of us. What is this cryptic component of which I question? I'm talking about, of course, the Fantasy Flight Proof of Purchase. Hi, I'm Chaz Marler of Pair of Dice Paradise, and as I was opening my most recent Fantasy Flight acquisition, I began to ponder the obligatory proof of purchase that comes batched inside every box that they bundle. What does it do? How is it used? These questions began to burn within my brain. It became my quest. I, I had to find out. So I began my journey of discovery by querying the hive mind of the internet and supping from the sweet nectar of knowledge harbored within it. I did a Google search. 
And online, I found fellow Fantasy Flight followers formulating feedback on its function in a few fan forums. But no matter how many forum threads I read and unraveled, the community always came to the same conclusion. Nobody really knows. Oh, there is the prevailing assumption that the proof of purchase is probably referenced when contacting Fantasy Flight for replacement parts, but nobody knew anybody who had actually used it this way. This purpose for the proof of purchase appeared to become an urban legend, like Kidney Thieves, Sasquatch, or Evil Cody. Unsatisfied, I took it upon myself to get to the bottom of this once and for all, by contacting Fantasy Flight directly. And so, I carefully composed my inquiring correspondence, asking how the proof of purchase tokens are used. And soon, I received this actual, absolutely real reply back from Fantasy Flight, which states, Chaz, thank you for contacting Fantasy Flight Games. Proof of purchase is usually for, well, proof of purchase. Have a great rest of your week. Smiley face. Best Fantasy Flight Games customer service team. You can't argue with that logic. Yes, Fantasy Flight customer service representative, your answer is technically 100% correct. But more importantly, I think it proves my original theory that apparently there isn't anybody anywhere who knows what the Fantasy Flight proof of purchases are used for. You know, but maybe... That's all the purpose that they really need. Well, here's the part of the show where I talk about five more of my favorite expansions as we go higher and higher into my list. So we'll start here today with the stunt expansion for Pitch Car. Now, Pitch Car is a game I like where you're flicking discs around a track. Very easy. You buy a couple sets of that. You can make some really neat setups. This stunt expansion is not one that's necessary to the game, but it, what it did was it added an extra level where you would go up. You know, now you had to go up a ramp, and now you could have levels, and you could have levels that went over things. It's not the easiest one to set up, and it is very difficult to do it. You would be surprised at how hard it is to go up a ramp onto another level when you're playing the game. But it is pretty neat, and it adds a really cool visual effect when you're playing Pitch Car, which makes it an expansion I like very much. The next expansion is just called The Big Expansion, and this is for Galaxy Trucker from uh, uh, CGE, and Galaxy Trucker was already a great game. In fact, there's two expansions for it, the big expansion and I think the bigger expansion, which is also a fine expansion, but I like the first expansion better. This adds a ton more uh, tiles that you can add to the game, uh, all different ways to make your spaceships now, and I love the alternate spaceships uh, things. They even have one that looks kind of like the Enterprise. Uh, the Lots of different options, ways to make the game harder because, you know, it obviously wasn't hard enough as it was. I like this expansion a lot. The only reason it's not like up in my top 20 expansions is because many times I don't want to play with it and it's very difficult to separate it out from the original game. But it still is neat. It's I can't teach it when I teach. I always have to teach the base game first then add this in later but the impenetrable points, the, the things that are half and half, I really like all the different modules this adds, the big expansion. Then the first expansion for Settlers of Catan, Seafarers. Now, there are times where I think Seafarers should have been included in the base game. For one thing, it makes one of the resources, sheep, more useful because you use those to build the ships. But also, it, it adds some a small bit of exploration, especially when you play with the scenarios where you like go looking for islands and move your ships out. But I feel like more than anything else, it kind of balanced the game out a little bit, gave you something else to do, and adds almost no new rules to the game. It's so easy to explain to people, so easy to jump into. This is why many people who love Settlers of Catan, when they're introduced to seafarers, love it. And then when they're introduced to Cities and Knights, they will love that or hate it. You know, they go one of two different directions. I'm not as big of a fan of Cities and Knights, but I do like Seafarers. I think it took the base game and moved on with it, adding ships and just a little bit more, but kind of fully realizing, I think, what the game should have been all along. Then we have uh, the Jumbo expansion. Now, 
Uh, this is a really small, tiny card expansion. Just, just the. It's called the expansion for Jumbo. And it's three modules. Two of the modules change some minor rules of the game, give you uh, different things you can do, but the one module just adds 40 more cards. Now, I love Jumbo, and now I've mixed Jumbo with the game Asante, and they kind of, they're almost the same game, and they mix, they intermix very easily, but these 40 cards for Jumbo, when they came out, I was like, wow, the game was great. I love Jumbo, and this just added some more stuff, and it added just, an, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. It's a small deck of cards, and it added just enough variety to the game to make it very interesting. And then finally today, the Dunwich Horror Expansion for Arkham Horror. Now, there's a lot of expansions for Arkham Horror. In fact, Arkham Horror has so many expansions. One of the expansions was an expansion for the expansions. Dominion needs one of those. But anyhow, in Arkham Horror, they, they, they added different things each time, but Dunwich Horror just added a ton of stuff. So it, it's the reason it's the one that made my list, but it added some of my favorite things. It added Injury and Madness cards, where you could pick one of these cards which would cause a negative effect to you um, for the rest of the game, but it would keep you from having to go to the hospital or going insane. It's kind of this tough choice of what to do there. Um, it added lots more cards. It added the Dunwich board, where you would go and fight the Dunwich Horror, which was kind of this nasty creature you needed to buy tickets to go back and forth. It, it came very close to pushing Arkham over just the too complicated direction, but but it added so much content. I think this one added the most content of all the expansions for Arkham Horror. Thus, that's why it made my list. Five more expansions next week. See you guys then. Okay, we're here with uh, Christopher Yurenko. Right. Uh, Daft Concepts. Yes. And uh, what do you, tell us what you got here. So what we did is it's just a uh, custom laser cut Firefly board uh, with the expansion. So it's a uh, it's, uh, dyed Baltic birch that we then laser etched. And then we uh, put that in a frame. It's got a UV printed acrylic uh, layer that goes over top of that. So all the lettering is underneath it. So it's smooth. You can play out. Then the whole thing's uh, set up just in a picture frame so that when you're uh, not playing it, you can hang it on the wall. <laughs> but as you see, we're uh, playing it right now. We've got the expansion and the main board uh, available. So it's uh, it's quite the beautiful piece. That is that is absolutely beautiful. And you got this for other games too, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, uh, we get requests for them. And so then we just work them out and we come up with kind of cool designs that allow people to kind of show it off at the same time and then just have something for the game they love. That is that is very cool. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Hey, somebody help me on my feet again. And I don't... Hi, Suzanne here. This week's featured board game app. Box topping is the practice of recording gameplay info on the inside of your game lids. I don't do that because I'm really finicky about my games, but I do love recording gameplays thanks to technology. Today I'm going to cover an iOS app that I use to record plays, but I will cover an Android alternative in the future. Board Game Stats is an app that focuses on capturing your gameplay data and producing some really great infographics around that. The app lets you create lists of games, players, and locations that you can use to quickly and thoroughly log your gameplays. Games can be linked to BoardGameGeek.com, and you can upload your gameplay info to your BGG user database as well. For gameplays, there's a lot of features here, including the ability to add photos from a specific play or write custom comments. The app is attractive, it's easy to use, and has an intuitive UI. And I like that the developer has provided a lot of incremental improvements over the last few months and seems to incorporate feedback from his users. Why bother tracking your games? Well, people do it for different reasons, of course. It can be a great way to monitor improvements in your gameplay, i.e. how many times you win. Or you can quickly figure out exactly how long has it been since you played a game of TI3. Personally, I just find it fun and interesting to look back. It's kind of like a trip down board game memory lane. Whatever your reason to record gameplays, I highly recommend you give Board Game Stats a try. A long time ago, Mark Rosewater wrote an article, and you can still find it on the internet, about different types of Magic the Gathering players, and he called them Timmy, Johnny, and Spike. Now, I feel that his characterizations of these players 
is too generalistic. I think there's more than just three types of players. Although the player that is called Spike is someone that in board gaming circles we often, or RPGs especially, we call that person the munchkin, the person who wants to win at all costs. Um, but I noticed uh, when I posted some of my top 10 lists of the Mage Wars cards, some people called me a Timmy, and I was reminded of the article, so I went back and reread it. And I think I'm maybe halfway between Timmy and Johnny in the article, and it got me thinking about how I do play games, especially games where you can customize and do your own thing. See, I love board games that offer a ton of variety, and I love when I can pick different things. Uh, a good example of that would be HeroScape, a game that came out in the early 2000s, and uh, just there was so much cool content for it, so many different characters, and you can make your own team. And uh, when I, I played in HeroScape tournament, Tournaments before, and when I go to one of these tournaments, uh, I, I'll play against people who have this very cool team, and they usually proceed to shred me. When I pick these things, I'm like, "Ooh, that sounds really cool. I want to use do that. Ooh, that sounds really neat. If I could, do, or wow, this really cool combo. If I can just pull that combo off, that would be amazing." And so when I play these games, I will often not pull the combo off because, well, you know, it didn't work out that game, and I will lose. But when I pull the combo off, I'm thrilled. When I get a game like Mage Wars or Summoner Wars and there's some humongous monster beast, I'm excited. Can I use this guy? And that's why Magic the Gathering for a while for me was not very interesting to me because those really huge characters, those really neat effects, those really awesome things were too expensive or too difficult unless you somehow built some super deck that let you do them. And that's why I fell in love with the Commander version of Magic the Gathering, because you had 40 life. You had the only allowed to have one card in a deck of each type, and you could get these giant things out of the table. Ah, oh, yes! Commander was built for me. And so I look at how I play, and you know, the way I play is not conducive to everyone. I don't think everyone should be like me in that regard. I don't think everyone should say, ooh, let's try this out. If it's cool, if it works, that would be cool. If it doesn't, oh well, we'll try it again. Because as Mark noted in his, in his article, Timmy's and, and Johnny's don't care if they win most of the time. If they win one game out of 10, but they won it in a cool fashion, they're very happy. While Spike, the tournament gamer, if he wins nine games out of 10 and he thinks he could have won that 10th game, He's really annoyed. Now again, this is all generalization, but that is how I really am. I like to win games, and when I win games, I want to try to win them some cool ways. I mean, I, I have in times past got into the spike mindset that I will win this game. But for the most part, I don't care how I lose, but I tried something cool. Ooh, I'll try this. Ooh, uh, that didn't work. Ooh, I'll try that. Ooh, that didn't work. Ooh, I'll try this. Ooh, it worked. Yes! And I, again, well, I don't think that everyone needs to be like me, and I certainly don't mind playing against all types. I like playing against people who are like me the best. Because when I am so excited when somebody else I play against tries some really ridiculous odd combo and it works. I'm like, wow, that's so neat. To me, it's neat just to see it happen. Um, even if it's at the cost of destroying half my army. I'm just always very impressed by that. To me, that's a lot more impressive than someone who has fine-tuned some deck to win by some weird combination. When I play this, 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 and this, look at that, cool, you know, it all works together and I destroyed you. Oh, okay, that's cool, but you just took that monster and made it super gigantic, double three times its strength and it can make six attacks. Wow! That's so much fun for me to see. I love to see things like that. I love that. So maybe I am a bit of a Timmy to see these smashing things. And you know what? I would imagine there's many people out there probably watching this who would say, Ugh, I don't want to play against you. I only want to play against someone who's going to play their very best and try everything they can in their power to win the game. And that's fine because there are people out there who would love to play with you and be like that. But for me, I just want to see what a game can do. What's the full potential? What's the biggest attack I can pull off? What's the neatest combo? What theme can I pull off in this game? You know, uh, I finally got this person to wear the crown in this that's what's really exciting to me, and that's what makes games a lot of fun. And that's why I like Caverna better than Agricola, because I can be sheep monger, the king of sheep, if I want to, rather than have to look and say, this is the most streamlined way to play the game. And it actually explains my philosophy and how I play a lot of games. So 
Check out the article. I'll put a link in the comments. It's very interesting, and I'm and maybe someday we'll we'll do something along the same lines with board games and talk about types of gamers with there and write our own article. Sometimes it can be difficult to figure out what your boss wants exactly. Unless he, for example, announces it over the internet to 20,000 people. Has acquired the rights to make a movie and TV show about Settlers of Catan. Oh, Jared's going to have a field day with this. So, Settlers of Catan, the movie. Shortly after this was announced, the Washington Post ran a humorous article. I'd suggest you read it, although you may find it somewhat unsettling. Now, can you really do a movie based on Settlers of Catan? Well, we'll find out together. But the answer is no. Uh, as I pointed out a couple months ago, the reason that the movie Clue was so successful as an adaption from a board game is threefold. They were operating within existing genre conventions of a murder mystery and a screwball comedy. There were characters that everybody knew, was familiar with, Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard, and so forth. Uh, and there was a very basic premise that anyone could understand. We're trying to find out who killed him, and where, and with what. Now, Settlers, on the other hand, has none of these things. There are no characters in Settlers at all, unless you want to say there's a robber, or a seafarer, or a trader, and a barbarian, or an explorer, and a pirate. So then what about the premise? Well, according to the current box cover, the premise is trade, build, settle, which given the double meaning of the word to settle in the English language would work if it were a melancholy romantic comedy directed by Woody Allen. Now, as for the final point, established genre conventions, settlers would probably have to be some kind of generic fantasy. So here's what's going to happen. Um, there's some original fantasy script that some aspiring screenwriter has written, and they're just going to take that and paste the settler's theme on top of it. It's kind of like what happened 10 years ago with the iRobot movie, where you have this Asimov series of short stories, and everyone's familiar with the title, but you can't really turn a movie into it, and so they just mush it together. But hey, as long as it's dark and gritty, that's all that matters, right? Because we can't unironically enjoy something from our youth unless it's dark and gritty. And now we come to the end of another board game breakfast. Ah, Monday's here, but lots of good things coming up this week. We will probably be doing a live playthrough of Imperial Assault, the tactical part of it, not the story playing through, but the tactical thing on Friday. So look for when we set a date for that up. It should be during the day sometime this coming Friday. And of course, then again at 8 o'clock tonight, my question and answer time. Well, until then, folks, I hope you have a fantastic week. Have fun playing games. Have fun doing all kinds of things. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at Cool Stuff, Inc.